Aloha, friends. We'll get started in a second. All right, welcome everyone throughout the ACDA Western region and beyond. My name is Dr. Jace Kaholakulisaplan and I serve as chair of our diversity, equity and inclusion committee here for the ACDA Western region. We are here today for our final installment of our DEI virtual series for the year. And we end celebrating the theme entitled culturally responsive mentorship. How awesome at the very end of our time together that we have a panel with us today, led by the incredible Dr. Corrine Duffy and educators and graduate students throughout the Western region. I will now do my best to introduce everyone. But before we begin a land acknowledgement, I come to you from the land of the Kanaka Maoli here in Manoa Valley, and I'm very, very excited to be with you today. We start off with James Higgs, who is a DMA student in choral conducting at the University of Arizona. Currently, James is a pianist and organist at Abounding Grace Lutheran Church and an assistant conductor to the Helios Ensemble. He also works with the University of Arizona's Treble Glee and Symphonic Choirs. We also have uh, Mire Lee, who is a graduate student at the University of Arizona, who works with a number of ensembles there at the University of Arizona. And we are very, very delighted to have her with us today. We also have Lauren Kanoilani Chang Williams, who is uh, who serves as an educator of choir, mele, and the Lala Hawaii at Punahou School. She is also a kumuhula or a master hula teacher for Halau Napula, Napua Halaku Noikikai and is a board member of ACDA Hawaii. We also have Elizabeth Kiana Nuhea Baker, who is the choir and ukulele teacher at Ilima Intermediate School. Elizabeth is a recent graduate in music education from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She also serves as the first year membership coordinator for ACDA Hawaii and as the social media chair for ACDA Western. Finally, it is my greatest privilege to introduce a mentor of mine, Dr. Kareem Duffy who serves as the Director of Choral Activities at the University of Montana and as Artistic Director for the Missoula Community Chorus. She is a champion for just creating and cultivating culturally responsive relationships and ensuring that mentorship is an ever expanding and involving form. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce these fantastic educators led and steered by Dr. Duffy. Dr. Do Dr. Duffy, please take it away. Thank you so much. And talking about mentorship and just relationships, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Saplan, because um, I met you first when you were a student, and now you're one of my dearest friends. And I'm so fortunate to have you in the profession and to count you as my colleague and my friend. And thank you for having us here today. Um, thank you to all of the panelists for sharing your wisdom and your ideas and your thoughts. Um, everyone who's on this panel today has had experience both as a mentee and as a mentor um, in all sorts of different contexts. So we're really excited to have all of you. Um, I've been thinking about this topic for a good long time. Um, I first started thinking about it when I was a junior associate attorney, which was my profession before uh, I came back to music. Um, and when I was first placed um, at a law firm with a mentor, I noticed that mentorship was a very regimented concept, that there was an assignment of a mentor to a mentee, a junior associate and a partner. And that as a result of this, sometimes those mentor-mentee relationships went really well and it happened to be a serendipitous match and people would have wonderful lunches together and talk about how much their mentor was helping them. And in other cases, they had almost no contact whatsoever. Someone was in a different practice and they would only see each other once or twice a year. So it was mentor and name only and only on paper. And, it, and so as a result, it seemed arbitrary and kind of stiff 
to me. And then years later, when I first started uh, teaching in the collegiate setting, I would notice that students would come up to me um, kind of randomly and say things like, oh my goodness, uh, I need to ask your opinion about this. You know, I, I, I'm on a job search and I have an interview and I have to ask you about this because you know you're my mentor. Or, or any not one of a number of topics, some of them quite personal and some of them just what you would think, you know, questions about job searches or about graduate school or about, you know, how to conduct something, right? Um, and at first I was doing the headlights, like, you know, oh, you have to help me, you're my mentor. I am, uh, I am, I am, okay, I am, let's do this, here we go. So, and, and, I, and then I started thinking about it and I thought, well, this is really probably the way it should be because students should be able to choose, right? We, all of us, and it doesn't matter, and we're all still students, right? We're all kind of forever students um, in the world and also in our own craft, which is choral conducting, but we should have the chance to choose our own mentors and to, and to be able to approach someone and ask a question and say, and identify someone as our mentor in a lot of different contexts. And some of them were very personal. People would ask questions about domestic relationships, reproductive health, mental health. Um, and, you know, I, I, I sort of pivot and deal with that. And then, you know, on a dime, then we're back to just talking about the sort of things that you would expect that a choral conducting faculty would be asked about. So um, I've been thinking about what does mentorship mean today? Here we are in May of 2021. We've had quite a year, obviously, and everybody has taught differently and has learned differently this year than usual. Um, and so I'd like to pass this along to our panelists, um, maybe starting with Elizabeth, talking about, okay, so mentorship, it can be pretty stilted and formal, but maybe there's a way to take the edge off. And can you talk a little bit about what you think about mentorship and how it works best? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so I experienced like mentorship in both of those ways. Coming into the Department of Education right after graduation, I was assigned a school level mentor whom I happen to love and adore her and she's fantastic and great. Um, so I have experienced mentorship in the way that you've explained Dr. Duffy and kind of, you know, being assigned and we have set meetings and every Thursday afternoon we meet and we chat and I have questions that I read on a post it. it's a whole thing. Um, but I've also experienced that type of mentorship as a student when because of positionality and because of being a choral student who becomes your mentor. Right. Um, and something that I've really seen here in Hawaii, especially for our culture in our local culture, is that a huge part of mentorship revolves around food and eating and sharing meals together. Um, and so Dr. Sopan was or is uh, one of many mentors in my life, but a huge one in so many senses in my career, in my journey as a Native Hawaiian woman. Um, and our relationship centers so much around food. <laughs> and I was reflecting on all of this and all of those like pivotal times. Uh, the first time we met was at a coffee bean and tea leaf. Um, and then many, many meals were shared over my various life crises in college as they do, right? Before we left for um, ACDA Western back in March, 2020, we went to Hot Pot. Um, so, so many times were shared over food. And I think that I was kind of thinking like, why is food so special to us here in Hawaii? Like, why do I think that that's such a critical aspect of mentorship? And it comes down to a couple of things. I was trying to, you know, psychoanalyze, like, why is it? Why is that so special? I think on one hand, when you have a meal with someone, they become a person, right? They now have preferences. They chose soy milk. You might not have known before that they would choose soy milk, or maybe they asked for no cilantro in the salad, right? It's like, oh, you're a no cilantro person. All right. And suddenly like your professor becomes a human who has preferences and a life outside of talking to you about choral literature. I'm like, okay. So when food is involved in mentorship, I think it, it adds a layer of humanity that is so necessary for, for both parties. And I think as a mentee, it allows you to be a person too. You don't just have to be in the please help me role. You can just be a person as well. 
The other thing I think as to why food is such an important aspect of our relationship and in the relationships of so many um, mentors and, and mentees is because it's a huge part of our culture. And when we go to a meal, we don't just bring ourselves. And when you talk story with someone else, you also bring the stories of your family, right? So when we go out, I also bring my mother and my father and my grandmother, and my grandfather and all of their stories. And the person I'm with will bring all of those things as well. And so all of that kind of comes down to, I honestly think that food is a incredibly essential part of mentorship because it takes the edge off. It allows you to be people without any predetermined hierarchies and it allows you to bring yourself and all of the people who came before you into that space. I think that's beautiful and Elizabeth I mean I think really getting to the heart of what you're saying too is that it opens us up to make us vulnerable right because if you're sitting at a table and you're ordering something or you're having a beverage together, then that lets us be vulnerable. And Lauren, I was going to ask you about that because um, I think you have some things to offer us about being vulnerable as mentors with our mentees. Sure. Um, well, you, you'd think that Elizabeth and I know each other because, you know, I'm about to talk about food too. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, for me, especially this year, but I think I think every year what I try to do with my students is, you know, less about teaching them the choral craft because I definitely feel that I'm still learning that in so many ways and I learn it from, you know, what what they give back to me when when I'm conducting them and oh, well, I better learn to do that differently because I don't like what they're giving me, <laughs> you know. Um, but one of the things uh, that came to mind when Dr. Duffy asked me about this mentorship, uh, one of the things that I find that I share with almost every choir that I have. Um, the school that I teach at here in Hawaii is uh, a fairly well-known school. It's a school that Barack Obama attended, Punahou School, and it is assumed by most that everyone here is affluent and, and wealthy, you know, and so every year it comes to that time of the choral potluck, you know, where you're all supposed to bring something to the table. And after a, a big concert, you're all going to share it. And one of the things that I always try to mention to my students is that not so many years ago, when I started here at this very school, I was going through a very difficult time with my, my family. We were running a business outside of school. And I went through a bankruptcy. And I remember showing up at the, the coral potluck with nothing in my hands and hoping that there would be food left over so I could bring it home to feed my family as, I mean, as the teacher of, of the choir, you know? And so I try to, to let those moments be very visible. It's painful, obviously, to talk about. And it, you lose a bit of power, I guess, um, you know, with, with, if that's what you're trying to have over your, over your ensemble. Um, but I have found that it, it draws me to the people in the choir who need the choir the most, maybe not for the musical aspects, but for the fact of belonging and for the idea that this ensemble is here to feed your soul and feed your belly if that's what it needs to be. Um, and so that's one example of a way having to do with food again, that I try to show my humanity, my vulnerability. And I think every day I try to point things out about myself. Hey, look, I, you know, didn't get to iron my, my, my clothes today. And, you know, we all just showed up and we're living through a pandemic. And, you know, I forgot my matching mask. Let's all wear the, the surgical paper mask and that walk of shame of wearing the, you know, so. Anyhow, I think um, more than Coral Craft, especially this year, it's just showing uh, our students that we struggle and we come through it and that as a ensemble, as a, as a huli, as a ohana within the, the as a family, um, within the choir that we're here for each other and we feel the same, the same way we you know, can empathize. It's just so incredibly moving to hear that story, Lauren, and thank you for sharing that really personal anecdote 
with us. And, you know, I think back to when I was in college a million years ago, and I was actually advised in a lecture by a choral conductor that our personal lives need to be checked at the door when we walk into our choral classroom, that those students do not need to know. They do not need to know that you just came from a meeting with your principal. They do not need to know that you're going through this at home. They do not need to know anything. You come in and you are the same every single day. You are positive, you are light and sunshine, and you walk in and you say, welcome to whatever we're doing. And I think that while I, I think I understand, you know, what that, why, um, why I was taught that, I think that in today's world, what these students need more than anything is to see us as humans and to understand our suffering that we're willing to share with them. And that does make us vulnerable and shows, shows the students where we are and how we got there. And then James, I think you had something to say also about as mentors meeting the students where they are. And I would like to offer you the chance to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, when I when I was asked about this panel and I saw the title, it it kind of it was something that I was really interested in learning more about and kind of talking about more. Um, my and it kind of ties into things points that have been made already. Um, uh, I think that yeah, being culturally responsive is kind of an interesting uh, like idea. Um, and just from our conversation so far, I think maybe because I'm a little bit hungry, but also because, <laughs> but, um, you know, like just thinking about people coming from different cultures, from different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different levels of preparedness in music school and even higher education. Um, for me, uh, you know, part of my culture is also there's a big eating aspect in family meals and even, you know, in restaurants, family style eating. So it's like, you know, you kind of learn different things about people, especially about trust when you go to like a family style restaurant and you're ordering for an entire table or a hot pot, for example. And, you know, it, and it's it is a communal aspect um, and it also leads into kind of, oh, sorry for the glare about um, another part that I thought was important about mentorship, which is trust. Um, and, you know, going off of what was mentioned earlier too, you know, uh, how do you build trust with a mentor? Um, and especially, you know, if you're going through something or a student's going through something, how do they feel comfortable talking to you about those things and opening up? Or maybe the mentor said something that shuts them down um, and prevents them from opening up. Um, and it, it can be like a very slight comment that seems really, you know, not at the moment, not really that significant, but can really be effective um, at um, making students feel very self uh, self conscious. Um, um, and yeah, I think th those are kind of two uh, things that kind of um yeah got me interested in yeah i think that's great thing i'm gonna circle back to you in a couple of minutes james i wanted to um jump to mire for a minute and ask you um mire you were um offering i think some interesting um analysis of yourself as a mentee and um what you what you think is important to bring to the table to a mentor as a mentee, and I wanted to give you the chance to talk about that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I, I'm in the second year of the DMA uh, students. So I've been spending most of my time as a student. <laughs> and so I just think about it uh, when I just get the, the this session's topic. So I just thought, what, what should I do as a mentee? I mean, yeah, as a mentee to uh, to this mentorship goes well, it goes the best. So I think uh, I want to say the two, three things for the mind mindset as a mentee. I think first of all is that is uh, student should be the open minded. So for example, whenever uh, get the lesson, for example, from the my teacher, and they just give a uh, like comment or advice to your gesture but sometimes um that is just for me <laughs> sometimes i feel like uh, take it personally but it shouldn't so, so 
teachers should be just there for help help you always so you should just uh, always be ready to listen your teachers or mentors advice or uh, any comment for you and second thing is that um, as mentee we need to prepare all the time before when you have a meeting with your mentor uh, so for example what should i ask for him what is my goal of this mentoring or objective of this mentoring so that's the thing that i think yeah i think that's wonderful and also being able to really have a sense of you know who am i and what am i looking for from this conversation as a mentee you know what what do i need to ask for um because sometimes you know mentors can't read minds and sometimes, you know, they may not be sure, like, what does this student need right in this moment? Um, and, and is it, maybe what they need in this moment is something specifically about rehearsal technique, or maybe what they need in this moment is a cup of coffee, right? Or something, you know, a hot pot, goodness, we don't have that in Montana and I just would do anything, but um, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I will get back on topic. And our next topic is that we have a surprise guest um, who is not with us in person, but has uh, pre-recorded two videos for us to be able to show here now and to discuss. So Dr. Betsy Schauer um, at the University of Arizona is actually a mentor to two of our panelists, uh, Mireille and James. And um, her first segment that she recorded, um, she's talking about specifically mentoring her undergraduate students at U of A. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome um, not in person, but um, but previously recorded, Dr. Betsy Shower. Thank you so much to Dr. Duffy for inviting me to talk about mentorship in this wonderful session. Um, for undergraduates, mentorship to me has to do with figuring out where they are when they come into your charge and then figuring out where they need to get to be in order to do the things that they want to do professionally when they graduate. And so some of that is just navigating, going from being a learner who receives information largely in their maybe their previous experience to somebody who is an active and engaged learner who dialogues with all of the information they receive, whether it's in a book or from a professor or at a conference, and then applies critical thinking skills to determine whether they agree with it or how that can inform how they are in the profession of music for the rest of their lives. So that's really crucial. Um, developing confidence and then also giving them opportunities that are in a place where they can safely take risks. So we don't want them to fail, we want to set them up to succeed, but also we want to allow them some opportunities to safely fail so they know how to navigate that in the future. Um, helping them navigate the educational process, but also seeing opportunities that are available to them that are great for furthering their skills and experience and filling up their resume. So um, if there are, for example, opportunities for them to take a leadership position in a community choir or a church choir as a section leader or just to sing, um, helping direct them to those opportunities. Can they have a leadership position as a choir officer, a section leader, an ACDA officer? Um, should you urge them to attend conferences or to put together the student symposium um, so that they have those kind of opportunities. So by the time they graduate, they're comfortable to stand in front of groups of people and they are part of the profession. So I think those are important opportunities. I had wonderful mentors myself who pushed me and encouraged me when I finished the conducting class to go get a job where I could apply the skills and so I listened to them and did. And that was really crucial in setting me on a good path. And opportunities even from my high school choir director where she was gone, the substitute was in the room but I had the opportunity to lead or to conduct a piece or to be a section leader. And those are important um, mentoring aspects for undergraduate students. Well, I can only say I certainly wish um, I could have had the chance to have Dr. Shower as one of my incredible mentors. And um, she mentioned that she had great mentors as well. Um, and I know, uh, let's see, I think Elizabeth, you had something that you had wanted to say about um, our mentors' mentors. 
Yeah, um, and especially being in this space, we can see it evidently. I have my choral lineage here from Dr. Safan, from you, Dr. Duffy. Um, and something that I, I was just thinking on about mentorship is just that just as when we go to a meal, we bring like our families, when we enter rehearsals, we bring our mentors and our mentors' mentors, whether we knew them or not. Right. So when I walk into a space as a student of Dr. Saplan's, I bring Antinola Nakulu, I bring you, Dr. Duffy, I bring Dr. Sharon Paul, I bring Dr. Karen Kennedy, I bring all of these people with me, whether I, I had the honor to work with them or not. And, and from that lineage, I, I bring their idiosyncrasies and their gesture and their phrases, whether whether I, I knew that it was in me or not, and, and it just it passes down in this way that is really profound, um, I think, and that every time you step into a space of educating, of conducting, those people are all with you. And, and I recognize that whenever I stand in front of a choir, that it's not just me and my mentor, um, or even Dr. Felipe, who is now at the University of Arizona, who I had in my first year, not just all of my core mentors as well, as well but all the people who came before them. And so I, I find it incredibly humbling whenever I'm in front of a choir to recognize that positionality that we have. I thank you for mentioning that, Elizabeth. I think it's so important. And I know my teachers in the University of Southern California, where I was fortunate enough to um, do my doctoral studies, um, Dr. Joe Michael Scheibe um, talks all the time and brings in all the time his incredible mentor, Dr. Rodney Eichenberger. Um, my mentor, Dr. Nick Strimple, talks about Charles Hurt, who is sort of the founding father of, of the USC and national DMA program. So when we talk about mentorship, it's important to talk about the generations who have perceived, per, preceded us. Um, Dr. Scheibe likes to talk about how we take all of the different things that we've learned, put them in a Cuisinart and press the button and they all blend up and then what comes out is you know, what we take from these things. And then we become our own person, which is like you said, Elizabeth, an amalgam of these different things. Um, Mireille, you had a, an idea that was relevant particularly to our, our current year, which is how um, the COVID situation and our the proliferation has, of Zoom has opened up new opportunities for mentorship. And I wanted to give you the chance to talk about that. Yes. Uh... In the Arizona graduate chapter SCDA, so we uh, the plan to invite some conductor or some composers who live in the outside of the United States. So we invite them on the Zoom. So so we have a chance to uh, listen uh, how they are working and or their thought any anything related to music or outside of the music. That is really, really helpful for a uh, graduate student. Um, and also, I think that is a really, really great opportunity to like connect to each other, even though we haven't seen uh, each other in person. So that is a really good starting uh, point to connect uh, maybe lifelong uh, relationship, or we can invite them in person later uh, when the COVID is gone. Yeah. I think that's such a brilliant point because I think sometimes we tend to stereotype mentorship as something that happens, a regular one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> relationship that develops over years. However, um, Mireille, what you just mentioned about Zoom sessions during COVID and Elizabeth, I think you also had an idea about um, uh, instances in which um, maybe you meet someone only one time over a Zoom. Oh, and then Lauren, I see your hand. So let's jump to Elizabeth and then we'll go straight or we'll go whoever wants to go first. Okay. Um, yeah, so just similarly, sometimes we're going off of that whole the Cuisinart, right? What is our, who are you as a conductor smoothie? Yeah, um, I, I think that so much of it, so many of the ingredients we know and we recognize, like, yes, this is my mentor, that's my mentor's mentor, this is who I am. But some of it also comes in people you watch like at one session at a regional conference or someone that you overhear a conversation when you're you know, walking by them at, I don't know where else you would be besides a conference. 
a mall of coral people. I don't know. But <laughs> in, in these informal interactions, you still take something from those people, whether it was intended to be mentorship or not. And I just think it's a really cool thing to recognize that you kind of have, I'm imagining, you know, when we were like kids, they have those little sticky hands, they'd give you the dentist and you'd throw it and it'd stick on the wall. I don't know if anyone else's dentist had that. Um, I feel like people's ideas are like that and they get flung and some of them stick to us and then we carry them whether or not that person had intended it for us. So just another cool aspect of mentorship and its intentionality. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, Lauren. Sorry. Um, I, I was just thinking about Mide's comments about um, the opportunities of Zoom. And I come from a hula background. And um, there is a, a proverb that we use in Hawaiian culture, which says, healo a healo. And your alo is your presence, your face, basically this whole front part of your body. And for many, many generations, as long as I can remember, um, hula has been passed on healo a healo, in person, face to face. And even now, during this time of pandemic, there are many master teachers that refuse to teach because this Zoom, they don't feel is worthy of, of passing on the information. So I think from a, just from a cultural knowledge and, and from a standpoint of just valuing knowledge, um, I see a lot of my colleagues jumping on every Zoom and on every conference and just kind of, um, we call, call it mana grabbing. It's sort of like, oh, they have their good idea. I'm gonna go to that Zoom and I'm gonna watch that replay and I'm gonna get all the things. And we're in this place because of survival. This is what we need to do right now is we need to grab all the mana and grab all the ike, the power and the knowledge from all of these places. But I guess my, my elder self is saying, when this passes, as Elizabeth and Mireille also both said, is I hope that we will strive to, um, to connect that loop face to face, because although there is so much that we can gain from all of these Zoom, Zooming around the world, um, we all know that there is something about face to face connection that will solidify and cement that knowledge in our practice. And so I guess I'm on the other side, just saying that, you know, let's, let's be careful and let's find those connections that we um, can through this time. But remember to follow up with those people in, in real life when we can. <laughs> hey, aloha, hey, aloha. Yeah, I think that's really brilliant. I mean, I, um, sometimes there's a certain, um, I think James and I were discussing this uh, yesterday. Sometimes there's a certain falseness to what we, what's going on now since we have such access to social media and being able to sort of trumpet our wonderful things that we're doing to everybody. And um, what I say all the time is that we have this uh, dilemma because we're in the performing arts. So that's performative. And yet important things like allyship or mentorship um, or culturally responsive teaching, none of those things can be performative or else they will be false. So how do you, how can you be on stage and yet avoid that performative aspect and make it true, right? Um, and James, you were talking also about the difference between um, even embracing multiculturalism, which is a very important thing to do as a teacher, as a mentor, as a choral conductor, but also how that is distinct from um, culturally responsive teaching. And in this case, sort of adjacent to that, which is culturally res responsive mentorship. I wanted to give you a chance to talk about that. Yeah, um, going off on, on what you were saying about the difference between like multiculturalism and and mentoring to someone and being and being aware of their culture and also kind of uh you know meeting them where they're where they're at um i think uh it's important and it's important to know that like if you're mentoring a student and it and it um and you're not being real with them or there's that kind of trust aspect missing the student can tell um and i think that's i think that's something to be aware of because um it's it's a it's a it's it's a challenge and um 
Yeah, I think, uh, especially with programming and things like that, we want to be careful not to like um, only have only have the the parts where we're embracing other cultures and being open to other cultures just in when just when we perform. Um, and just, you know, programming certain composers or even just having like one concert of uh, that that is, you know, kind of categorizing different cultures. Um, and I think students respond when they know that um, when they know that it's not just for the stage and that it's, you know, the, the you know, the classroom and the teacher is, um, you know, is welcoming to those kinds of different approaches yeah yeah and i that's wonderful i think mire you also wanted to talk about um specifically um the way uh dr shower in particular um is open to not only teaching her students but learning from them as well and i'd like to offer you the chance to talk about what you bring to the table um as a specialist in korean music oh uh, yeah um i think the mentor mentoring is not just one way to teach like they deliver information or from the teacher to student i think that is the the interchange there's knowledge or their thought or anything so mentor can learn from the mentee yeah definitely mentee learn from mentor all time uh so uh, the one thing i really uh appreciate it for dr shower or um uh, respect how Dr. Shower been doing for a student is that she always uh, ready and open to learn something new. So even though she are the professor and she really like smart, smart person ever than I met. Uh, but I'm from the South Korea. So maybe she doesn't know about the Korean traditional music or she are not unfamiliar with she, she's unfamiliar with the Korean music so she always asking um what is this and also she make a, a place to other my colleague to learn uh, what is the Korean music so I really appreciate it for that yeah 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 James please go ahead yeah to add on that I think um that you know you have to kind of take chances um and uh, that's something that i've kind of admired is that you know when dr shower has introduced uh, music to the choral literature uh syllabus it's like she doesn't you know you could you as a teacher you could step back and say well like well you know i don't know if they'll able be able to find that or if they'll be able to understand it or if or if it might be you might they might have to look too hard to find certain information you just put it there and then let us go <laughs> and try and find the things that we needed and then she was there to help us if we had roadblocks and i think that that's kind of an example because I think sometimes we get hung up with doing it the right way and and you only learn that by doing rather than just kind of baby stepping in, you know, if Mireille, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, can I add it? Uh, yeah, I think that is really, really important uh, as mentor uh, that I say earlier is so making the place to learn like outside of, I mean, I said, <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, the Dr. Shower, for example, she made a syllabus and added the, like, out, added the uh, outside of the Western, the major work, for example, Korean music or Chinese or Philippine music. That is really important as a, especially in the doctoral program because we are, uh, the future professor or the or teacher, so we can uh, have the opportunity to learn the new repertoire in future our performance. So and also, uh, the audience may listen what I choose the repertoire. So that also make a big impact or around the world. I think that is really <laughs> broad way broad. Uh, perspective, but 
I think you get it what I want to say, yeah. Yes, I think you, um, you and James both are kind of um, underscoring how important the connection, like if you had a Venn diagram of embracing multicultural music and culturally responsive, I'm trying to show the overlap, right? Because they do overlap and you're trying to get to that sweet spot in the middle, which um, actually makes that student teacher mentor mentee relationship all the, all the richer when it's when it's when it goes both ways and we're both we're all teaching each other on an equal playing field say at a table where we're all equals because we're eating together you know and 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 showing our vulnerability and this is probably a great time to play dr shower's second video which um was specifically targeted towards discussing mentoring of graduate students mentoring for graduate students is different in some ways from undergrads and also similar. Again, we're figuring out where they are and where they need to get to be in order to do what they want to do when they leave. We are really lucky at the University of Arizona to have a very diverse um, and inclusive population of graduate students. And that's something we really highly value. So it gives us the opportunity to learn from each other um, as long as we create a respectful and safe place for each other to learn. Um, it's important that we not assume that anybody in their sharing wants to primarily identify as whatever, their gender or their, um, their gender identity or expression is or their particular um, cultural, religious, or ethnic background. We give them opportunities to choose if that's something they would like to present on or research. And then that can be a really rich learning environment, but not assuming that. Um, we we want to figure out where they want to get to be. I don't want to assume that they all want to do the same thing when they graduate. So what kind of opportunities can I direct them to, to toward in order to be able to do those things? Um, our students get bombarded with emails about different kind of opportunities that they have, and they're just trying to get through their day and pass their classes. But if I can say, you should apply for this grant and to do a summer program. And here are some pro summer programs. Are you interested in any of those? Let me help you. Or here are some people that you can meet in the profession you want to go into so that you can be connected and, and already know um, some people that can help you on your path. So navigating academia is important, helping prepare them for what will be needed when they're applying for jobs and when they're in their first positions, and then of course staying connected with them through that process. I think it's important as a mentor to be super proactive in the job search process because there are so many things that are not part of your education that are required for that and helping to direct them to the right people and the right positions that will be a good fit for what they want. So those are some of the things that I think are really important for culturally responsive mentoring of graduate students. Thank you. One of the most amazing things I think that Dr. Schauer brought up in that uh, clip is that she really gives nuanced and particularized personal, personalized um, advice and direction for each student trying to take into uh, take to heart what that student is is looking for and find those opportunities. And I remember back, I mean, I went to college in the 90s and I was a person who was so interested in so many things. I was like, um, you know, master of none. What do they call it when you like, you're interested in everything. And so I tried, you know, I was a wannabe mentee for um, a few different uh, prospective mentors and kept bringing like my compositions to them, like trying to ask them to look at them or I would um, present myself as someone who wanted to pursue conducting and try, you know, try to get them to take an interest. And I kept hitting walls. Um, it's one of the reasons why I went to law school, because at the time I gave up and I felt like I just couldn't. Um, what I perceived at the time was it was there was this wall and all of those mentees who were achieving success were white males. And those that I really was trying to get to mentor me were white males. Um, where I found mentors at the time was in the English department. I went to the University of Michigan and I ended up writing an honors thesis as an undergrad. And those mentors offered this, the kind of thing that Dr. Schauer is talking about. Um, I wrote an undergraduate thesis that combined poetry and music and talked about the connections and they nurtured that interest, um, even though they weren't 
musicians themselves and they did their best to read the score and understand what I was trying to say um, in the in the English area. And so then, you know, I went to law school. Well, years later, I presented a lecture at the University of Miami on women in music. And um, afterwards, as I was packing up to head out, a young woman ran up to me and stopped me. And um, those of you who know me in person, see, we all need to know each other in person so that you know, I happen to be very short. I'm only five foot one. Um, and so this woman, ran, the young woman ran up to me. She seemed to me, she seemed like she was six foot tall, black woman, identified herself as a science major. I wanna say it was microbiology. And I thanked her for coming to the session and said, it's so nice to meet you. And she said, oh, are you kidding? I wasn't gonna miss it. As soon as I saw your picture and I read your bio, I said, I have to come to this session because you and I are the same person. I, I said to myself, she is me. And after I picked my jaw up off the floor and I was like, we are, you know, I was like the biggest compliment I've ever had in my life. I said, you, you know, this is, this is all the thoughts started churning in my head, which is that we never know who might see themselves in us. And it suddenly dawned on me that all those years and years ago in undergrad, the problem wasn't that I couldn't see myself in those white male professors that I desperately wanted to be my mentor. It's perhaps that they couldn't see themselves in me. And so now my job is to reverse that course and make sure that I try to see myself in every student and find that way, like Dr. Shower said, to try to say, okay, here's a grant for you. Why don't you apply to this? You know, you got a lot of things on your plate. You're getting lots of emails. Let's talk about what's right for you. Let's have you teach me what's your area of specialty. Um, and so I think, you know, there's so many different ways to go about mentorship, whether it's like we talked about the day to day over a period of 10 years, or if it's like we get one session with this person and they say something that, you know, might stick with us forever. And we've probably all been to sessions like that. You know, and then we try to, like Lauren suggested, reach out um, to them and pursue something maybe later and say, hey, I saw you on Zoom five years ago back in that pandemic. And remember, you did this Zoom session. You probably don't remember me, but I was there taking notes, you know, and then we'll we'll um, we'll be able to talk to them. So at, at this moment in time, I'd like to um, thank all of you so much. And I think we're going to um, break for questions and each of you will probably have a chance to speak up once more if we have any questions or comments in the chat and also turn the floor over to Dr. Saplan. Thank you. Hello, uh, could we have a round of applause for Dr. Duffy and all of you? Thank you so much. Such lovely insight. Um, we're gonna start off with uh, a concept that leads into the question. So Edward Hall is a psychologist, an anthropologist and an educator. And he came up with this idea of what we call the cultural iceberg. In this cultural iceberg, it's separated by water. At the very top is what we can see, obviously because there's water at the underneath of an iceberg, so what we can't see. He came up with this metaphor because it shows the limitation of how we discuss culture in the past. Perhaps what is visible is what we can consider repertoire, text, performance practices, um, what uh, everything that is seen within the choral craft. But what is underneath it is how we display and articulate trust, how we show love, how we show and receive uh, pot potentially anxiety, right? All of those things that are unseen. And so I like to kind of envision mentorship as the water that separates surface culture from deep culture. In this question, or throughout this entire hour, we've received metaphors or we received examples of how to get from surface culture to deep culture. For instance, food is a great way to relinquish or to unmurky the waters between surface and deep. But could we perhaps go around the room and think about aside from food, what are other activities that a mentor and a mentee could step into together outside of choral musicking that can help spur or help relinquish a power dynamic that muddies surface and deep culture? What are some things that we can do as mentors and as mentees to help, uh, to help 
serve as a catalyst in bridging surface and deep culture together. I'd like to ask Dr. Duffy to go first. Well, I actually had a thought to maybe pass it to Lauren because one thought that I had, and this is going back to what Mire said about Dr. Shower's openness to learning about um, the students' um, areas of passion. Um, and so Lauren, um, you know, you come to choral music with another arts area and cultural area of expertise, um, so which is dance. And I was wondering if maybe you could talk about sort of leading by example and leading with passion and showing um, maybe um, participating in some other arts area with people, whether it be a group of mentees or a single mentee and doing something um, other than uh, choral singing, but perhaps showing your your um, your knowledge and modeling. Sure. Yeah, I uh, I come from a hula background, so um, Hawaiian dance, and uh, students who enroll in my choral uh, ensembles will quickly find out that we dance and we do hula basic steps and we chant and we learn about Hawaiian texts probably even more than we learn about the Western music canon. And I think all, all I can say is that that is what I'm passionate about. And I strive to let that just ooze out of me whenever possible. Um, and not because I think that every student that comes through my classroom should be interested in it, but I think that they should have the opportunity to see someone so excited about a topic that they just won't shut up about it you know? <laughs> and, and just um, to let them get into a, a space where they they start to understand that that I'm truly obsessed with with everything hula and Hawaiian music and and then to leave space to hear that they are obsessed with Bob Marley and then try to see is there a way that those two things go together and then is there a way that hula and Bob Marley and the Western Choral Canon um, speak to one another and so so just trying to see where our passions again it's this Venn diagram where do where do we intersect. So. I, I think that's so brilliant. So sorry to answer your question for myself, Dr. Saplan. I think, um, and the reason I passed it to Lauren is because I think sometimes diffusing the tension of choral music um, is really hard. So one way to do it is to talk about passion for some other area, right? And it could be food or it could be hula. Um, for me, sometimes I talk about my kids. Um, that makes everybody laugh. I say the latest crazy thing that they may have mentioned. And um, like, for example, um, I was mentioning that I was going to be seeing someone's stepdaughter um, yesterday. And my son said, a stepdaughter? Is she a nice stepdaughter or a mean step? You know, because they think step mother right from Disney so they don't even know what a stepdaughter is but if it's step anything it must not be so anyway it, you know it just sort of then all of a sudden you start to think of something else right you're thinking of a little four-year-old boy and you know his crazy connotations so um that would be my answer to the question thanks yeah James go ahead I think something that that I've kind of come across in my own personal person in my personality is that um I tend to make, and I, I tend to make decisions about people or I kind of, you know, and I think we all do this. We kind of like, this is you, this is what you should do. This is kind of what can help you. I think, I think creating opportunities for students to share um, and to, and to uh, be a part of the conversation. I remember a teacher um, and at the time I thought it was a silly assignment, but he, he told us all to bring, to bring your favorite poem um, and then you were to read it to the class to our studio and recite it and whatever way you know you would like to um, but i mean i think there's so many different possibilities and i think uh last semester because of zoom um for like the trouble glee choir um we asked them to do these like um these five minute quick presentations on on music on what on a, an artist they'd like to share and that that like the the uh things that they came up with were like all over the place and some of them were really silly some were really serious but i think it told a lot about 
things about them and their culture or their personality without me having to pull it out of them or me making up those things in my mind about them, I guess. So, yeah. That's brilliant, James. And I think one of the important things that that was, what was modeled was how interdisciplinary the curl craft can be, right? And I just love that sometimes when there's distance, we see more connection. For example, Dr. Shohei Kobayashi at Reed College is an avid skateboarder and will say to anyone, the reason why he skateboards is because it makes him a better conductor, right? Um, and for, especially here in Hawaii, we believe that the land is also one of our greatest teachers. So something that I like to do with my graduate students is we'll go to the ocean, right? And we'll be in the ocean. And we realize, oh, we could just swim and like, you know, have a conversation. Or, you know, we could really feel the resistance between beats two and three and finally like understand how to conduct a Durafly Requiem. It's entirely up to you, right? But I think the more that we show the complexities of the identities, kind of like what Elizabeth said, the it's it's not only boundary building, but it's also connection building because they can see the choral craft in all sorts of spaces. Um, Elizabeth, the question that we have for you is centered around centered around your position as a first year educator. Uh, the question is, you went from a, uh, a senior, an undergraduate senior to a first year educator. How has your connection to mentorship changed based off of that professional transition? Good question. Um, I've spent a year trying to figure that out. And I think that that transition has been a little awkward, to be honest, because so many of this year, so much of this year, as you know, we all agree, is was unknown, right? And and not only did I transition from positions, right, being a student to being now a mentor and a teacher, but I went from having four years of what I was told choral, the choral arts were, of what I thought I was going to be teaching. Then I graduated on a Zoom call, and now I was teaching a completely different thing. And so never getting to actualize those experiences left me feeling a little helpless and a, a little like, what did I just do for four years? And, and that whiplash of not only am I now supposed to know what I'm doing, I'm supposed to know what I'm doing in this thing that I, I, I haven't studied, right? Um, but I think that has also been really rewarding because it puts me in, in, in a unique position for my students. So personally, it's it's still been a little challenging because I'm still trying to find my, my find my feet and remember that I do know this and I went to school for this and I am good at my job and I do have things to offer my students and still feeling like, what the heck is this year, right? But I think something or a unique advantage that that I have having graduated so recently is I remember what it was like to be a student so, so vividly. And uh, Dr. Duffy and I were talking about this yesterday, but I think that that directly correlates with how I am as an educator. I don't assign things for busy work because I hated busy work. I knew when professors weren't giving me things that were intentional. I knew what it felt like when professors didn't recognize that I had six other classes who held me to the same expectations. And so in that sense, I think the fact that my student experience is so close in reach is, is an advantage because I tell my students when they walk in like, hey, I know that you have six other classes. I know that I'm not your priority. I don't expect you to spend 24 seven thinking about choir and, and that's okay as long as, as you are being a human in this space. Um, and as long as you're able to dedicate your time with us then you're gonna be okay. So I think that it's been a tricky transition, but it's also given me a unique advantage in advocating for my students in a way that is so strong because that situation and, and that part of my life is still so recent. Mahalo, Elizabeth, thank you. That was beautiful. Um, Mirai, your question is around your statement of um, you stepping into this role as a literature specialist of Korean repertoire um, and your connection around Dr. Shower's ability to allow you to choose that path for yourself um, and not necessarily based off of your inherent identity. So with all of that, if you were to construct a a, a future 
mentor, if you were to build the qualities of a mentor that speaks to the values of what the choral craft should be, what would those values be? Oh, I'm so sorry, Dr. Chaplin. Would you like to uh, rephrase of that question again for me? Sure, yeah. So what, what, what type of personalities or what types of characteristics do mentors need to have to usher in this new era of choral mentorship? Oh, yeah. Um, sometimes a uh, student doesn't get what teacher saying or what teacher wanted or any advice they need the time to change themselves or like grow up the better being better so i think the one thing the mentor need to do is like being patient there's a really really uh important thing yeah for the student yeah patience <laughs> What an important tool that we've been working on, especially these past nine months too. So thank you so much. Um, on behalf of our Western region, I just want to make sure that we offer a leo mahalo, a voice of gratitude to all of you, to Dr. Duffy, uh, to everyone on this panel. Thank you for being so giving and for offering the, us this important charge as we step forward into a new future and a new normal. Um, but with all of that said, I encourage, encourage all of us to rest this summer and to find spaces to breathe. Because I, especially here coming from the DEI committee, we are well aware of the inequities um, and the differentiations of, of, of positionalities throughout our region. So whether you find bucket, buckets and moments of healing and rest or whether you haven't, I think this time calls for us to collectively breathe together. This ends our final installment for our virtual DEI series. I'd love to thank our president, Lou De La Rosa, our committee, Dr. Duffy, all of our speakers throughout this past year. Uh, the committee too will have a break and we'll be sure to have a lot of interesting and a lot of engaging and relevant content in the fall. So from ACDA to you, thank you so much for spending your year and your evening with us. And we will see you folks later. Thank you. Aloha.